Hi, and welcome to Color Your Home Happy. I'm Justine, founder and creative mind behind Rainbow Shaker, a colorful interior design studio in London. My goal is to spread joy and happiness through the design of cheerful interiors. If, like me, you think that we need a colorful bubble to escape the daily gloom, then this podcast is definitely for you. Each episode, I will be welcoming well-known guests from various colorful backgrounds. You won't find us speaking about the right way to use colors. In this podcast, I want to help you trust your intuition and give you all the confidence you need when designing interiors full of dopamine. Hi everyone, thank you for joining another episode of Color Your Home Happy. I'm Justine, your colorful and quirky host and interior designer. And today, get ready for a colorful trip around the world. I have the pleasure of receiving Mamtaz Begum Hossein, real color superhero, vibrant artist, author of Color Rainbow, podcaster and more. Hi Mamtaz, how are Hi, you? Justine. I'm really well. I think this is probably one of the most fun locations I've ever recorded a podcast in. <laughs> so yeah, it's just pure joy, your home. Thank you. And <laughs> thank you for bringing all your sparkles here today. <laughs> You're making the whole space sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute pleasure. How have you been? Good. Just sort of gently sharing my messages with the world to, to be more colourful. Had the chance to go into two schools and to chat to young people about colour. And it was just so great to hear their interpretations. I really want to make sure that I get my message across to young mm. people because there's a point where children love colour yeah. and then adults sort of lose their confidence in colour. Yeah. So I think there's this key time, <laughs> early teens, we need to get there and remind them how wonderful colour is so that they don't become sort of like uncolourful adults. Yeah, completely. You kind of lose your attraction to colour or your connection with colour. And then at some point in your life, you experience a specific episode and then you connect back, you rediscover again, and then you connect to your inner child. <laughs> Colors bring us so much joy in our life. The colorful home, I think, is such an important topic because increasingly it feels that homes are becoming less colorful. Mm. And so just this reinjection of your home is your personal sanctuary. It can be whatever you want it to be. Yeah. And let's let's remember that. Let's not think about, I'm going to sell it in five years' time, so I need to keep it neutral. <laughs> It's just yeah. like we need to move away from that rhetoric and, and be in the here and now and enjoy the colour now. Yeah, completely. And even though we are both into really bright colours, even though we're here to give tips or we are not everyone, I think you have to find your colour palette that are vibing with your own personality. You know, I think that's really important because, um, I mean, we're both colourful dressers, but yeah. really my message is very much you don't need to wear colourful you don't have to walk around like a rainbow like I do and we do um to appreciate colour there's palettes for everyone you know if, if soft neutrals are your thing that is fine but just make sure you're using them don't save them you know <laughs> be immersed and surrounded by your colours and that's when you're going to be at your most um, happiest but also at your most productive and mm. you can just really kind of in, yeah get on and enjoy things you're not there's no restrictions there <laughs> And how has been your personal journey with colour? It's a strange one for me because I just feel like colour is so natural to me. Mm. So colour's always been in my life and there was no turning point. I sometimes hear other people's stories of the day, the moment they found colour. But really for me, I've just always had an appreciation for colour. It's just always brought me joy. And for some reason, I just felt that connection. As children, we we are surrounded by colour. We get to play with colour, play with crayons and paints and pens and I think I never grew out of that really I think I understood the power of color quite early on yeah. I knew that being around colors made me feel good and that has always stayed with me it's never felt like 
I would not be colourful. The idea of not choosing colours it just doesn't come to mind. The only time of my life where I had any colour restriction was obviously school uniform. Mm-hmm. And school uniform, yeah, yeah. you have to wear a certain colour day in, day out. But even then, I was always pushing it. So I'd wear this uniform to school, but I'd wear some purple lipstick or I'd be wearing jewellery. And when the teachers were going past, I'd like hide the jewellery. <laughs> and when they weren't there, you know, I'd have on my um, earrings and my um, pendants and stuff. I think self-expression is something that is such an amazing trait of being a human. And self-expression again it gets pushed out of us as adults to the point that we forget what self-expression is is we don't feel comfortable anymore and we lose it but if we can hold on to self-expression and be who we are authentically then that for me is like a life well lived like if in your life you were yourself and that's what you were doesn't matter what job you had it doesn't matter how much money you made but you were yourself I feel like that's the achievement in life that's what I just hope more people can start to get in tune with really yeah it's really important for your self-development for finding your your own self absolutely and it's one of the reasons I was very much drawn to color therapy I'm a certified color therapist and that's the area of color that I specialize in which is color for well-being and very much using color for our mental health, our physical health, our mind. Color is very much a natural energy source. It's an energy force and it affects how we feel. And for me, that's the area of color that I think we could all actually explore a bit more. Mm. We don't necessarily realize we can take color for granted. I think a lot of the time here I am in such a visual home, but color goes beyond that. Colour affects how we feel. Even if we can't see colours, we can generally get a feeling. For example, being in a blue room, you will naturally feel a bit cooler. You're in a yellow room, you will just feel naturally uplifted. And that is such a powerful tool. tool. Absolutely. So we just need to hone in, I think, a bit more on understanding how colours make us feel. And then we can use that knowledge and apply it into different aspects of our life. And what colours are you especially drawn to? One of the things I always say is that nobody's favourite colour stays the same throughout their (laughs) whole life. So the way colours work is that we need them at different times. They empower us with different feelings, different energies. And it's very much reflective of what you're going through at a certain time. If you're about to start a new job and you're going through a massive life change or you're emigrating or you're having a baby, your body and your mental state is needing certain energies for example you might be feeling in a more nurturing space you might be feeling in a more stressful space mm. certain colors can help us and naturally we suddenly surround ourselves in the colors that we need yeah. at a certain time and it kind of goes to explain why teenagers majority of teenagers will go through a black phase like they want their black bedroom and they just want to like hide away and wear black <laughs> <laughs> but, and some stay and that's fantastic but for some people it's a phase and it's a phase that they really need that color at that time to help them process what they're going through and for me the analogy would be over covid and pandemic mm-hmm. i just wanted green i needed green so much now green sits at the center of the rainbow it yeah. is the most balancing it balances out everything else gives us a lot of harmony a lot of calmness and that's very much what helped me get through that period was being around green really helps. And I had green hair then, so I had like green every day to, you know, just give me that energy. But when I was in my 20s, um, my hair was bright red. And I think I was quite loud then, and I was quite like uh, in a very different sociable space. And red was that sort of like garish, loud colour. And I wanted that. I wanted to be this popular person Mm. with red hair. But now I... I do not want red hair. <laughs> like <laughs> I, I don't crave that. I don't crave that energy at all. Mm. I'm very much in your kind of like aquas, cooling mints, lilacs, blues, mm. greens, very serene. And I think that shows a shift in my personality from being in my 20s um, to being my 40s now. That's quite a big difference. I've been through a lot in that sort of decade, two decades, and I feel more comfortable with who I am I'm happy with who I am and I feel that these greens and earthy mermaid sea tones is where I am now 
Did you get color inspiration from your travel because you're a travel blogger? Yeah, absolutely. I find that whatever I'm doing, the color is my number one priority. So if I'm watching a film, I'm looking at the colors. If I'm going to an art gallery, it's the colorful exhibitions. So for example, I was in the Tate Modern, which is like a huge gallery with lots of different rooms. I'll probably bypass the more dull colors and I'll be like, where's the color? Colour for me is like this magnet Mm. and I find it wherever I go. So for me, when I go on travels, I really enjoy soaking up the colours of a location. It's something that you don't necessarily realise, but wherever you go in the world, actually colours can look different. And being able to hone in on that when I go travelling is is a really satisfying thing. So I do have a travel blog where I specifically... If I'm going somewhere, I focus on yeah, the colours of a destination. What's interesting, I think, is is light. I mean, we're lucky we're mm-hmm. recording in a, a day. Um, we, I mean, it's it February. It's, it's, <laughs> it's been, you know, endless grey days. And I'm so happy I'm here on a light day where light is shining through. And I can imagine on a grey day, some of your sort of interiors will look slightly different. Mm-hmm. And wherever you go in the world, the light is at a different angle on the earth. It's going to be different different times of the day so these little nuances that you see is just really precious that's true about the light i like green i like plants but in here the light make them care as dull yeah when i travel to south america mm-hmm. to brazil yeah, the colors are so vibrant and plants they're like just vibrant yeah. popping you you have all these different shades of greens people are thinking yeah but plant green is just a earthy color mm-hmm. it cannot be as vibrant as red or but really depends on the lighting yeah lighting is is so so important i think you know when it comes to your home even before you think about the details before you think about the color schemes before you think about what little you know knickknacks you're going to have it's very much understanding okay where is the light Mm -hmm. where is the light going to be throughout the day and once you understand that i think that's when you can amplify okay this is where the light is i'm going to build these spaces and this is where i'm going to do certain things this is where i'm going to introduce colors this is where colors are going to look their best um i was saying to you when i got here because you've got a beautiful emerald green staircase and i'd seen so much beautiful emerald green like rooms in like interiors magazines and instagram and it looks so good and then when i went to the shops and i brought home like three or four different tester pots of emerald green. I thought, I really want that in my bedroom. But when I tried them on my wall, it's like they just looked black from a distance. They didn't look good. (laughs) This gorgeous green had lost its greenness and I simply didn't have the right light in the bedroom. So I think, again, you you see colours, but you have to experience them to realise, okay, this is right or not right. I have an obsession with Mexico. I think I've been like six times there's something about the colours of Mexico. It just gives me so much life. Like it's the most extraordinary place, whether it's like in the beaches, whether it's in the hills, like the cities. I just find it such a vibrant culture and I adore the colours of Mexico. I have, you've probably seen these, you get these like books, coffee table books, mm. and it will literally be like... Um, living in Mexico, living in Morocco, living in India. And it will just be these interiors books filled with images of um, different countries. And they just, they, they capture the beauty of those places. But then you can't necessarily apply it to your own home. Yeah. <laughs> it's not necessarily <laughs> going to have the same vibe. But I love that. I love how actually there's different aesthetics around the world and, and they work in those environments. That's not to say they have to be that way, but it does exist that where if you go in the world, there will be a different interior aesthetic and you really do see that when you're out and about traveling you can look at all the books in the world but until you see it for yourself you don't realize just how perfectly in place it looks I think what you also said in your book is to encourage people to explore, experiment and keep also a diary of the travels because you're soaking in all the inspiration. Mm. I have a practice called rainbow hunting where I literally seek out colours, look for colours, appreciate colours. And it's something that when I do go somewhere else, I like to kind of apply these methods of it's like a mindfulness approach to colour, really. It's slowing down, it's being in the present and finding the colours around you and just taking a moment to literally say hello to them. Mm. I went, you know, when I've been to like India, I've been to Bangladesh, you just look at a washing line and it will just be like so much colour. 
whether they've got their placemats and their tablecloths or their clothing. It's just pure colour. But if you saw an average washing line in someone's garden in the UK, you, you just you just won't get that. <laughs> so even something as simple as, OK, look around the world's washing lines. What do people's washings look like? I think it'd be very insightful in showing us how people use colour in their daily life. Also, when you travel, you notice that color has a different meaning in different cultures. For example, pink in Mexico meant charisma. Do you have any other examples of uh, Yeah, of that? I mean, I think this is such an interesting way, especially the kind of Western and non-Western divide of colors. One of the most exciting discoveries I've made on my travels was actually in Guatemala. Now, Guatemala was probably the first country I ever wanted to visit. When I was a teenager, I'd go to Camden Market, which is in London. And it's like, it's really like colourful, just full of like alternative aesthetics, much more than now, I have to say. So then there was a lot more sprawling markets and there's a lot of the global markets mm. and there was a lot of textiles and bags from abroad. And I'd see these Guatemalan textiles, like woven fabrics, so many colours in them. And it was just such a distinct aesthetic. So I'd always, always wanted to go there. And I just couldn't wait. And when I did go to Guatemala, I did a trip around um, Central America. So I went to a few different countries. And when I went there, I was aware that they actually had the largest craft market in the whole of Central America. So I thought I'm going to definitely go to this market. It was like the dream because it was like my dream destination because it, it's like miles of Yeah, colourful textiles, beadwork, all the different sort of like Mayan outfits because the women who live there in particular are just dressed in Mayan clothing. So this aesthetic and this heritage, it's not put on for the market, it's literally just like how people walk around. But I was traveling on a bus and every now and then on the landscape, I just saw this like, it was like a rainbow, like a rainbow on the landscape of lots of colorful blocks, lots of colorful buildings. Mm. So you'd have this sort of like neutral, I guess, almost deserty landscape when you're just traveling, just this like rainbow oasis. And then when I got to my destination, I realized that all of these rainbow oases were actually graveyards. You know, it completely blew my mind. So I, I went up to one, well, went to go and explore the graveyard and discovered that every single tomb, every single grave was just a different color. So no two were the same. And there was actually a funeral going on and every single guest was colorfully dressed wow. because they were literally celebrating the life of you know her, whoever it was had passed away and just such a contrast to a UK funeral where it's black mm. you know it's going to be quite a morbid affair it's going to be quite low energy mm. if you didn't wear black it would be like horrifying yeah or Somewhere like India, you'd wear white to a funeral. So it's kind of like the extreme of black. But to discover that there was a culture in the world in a country where actually funerals are colourful, <laughs> it was just like, what an amazing thing to know. It just spins everything you've ever learned on your head to understand that. And a couple of years later, I actually went to an art exhibition about uh, graveyards from around the world and discovered that there are other places that have colourful graveyards too. Mm. And so if we just stay in our silo of just what we know, we don't realize there's other ways to be. Mm. Because when we look at travel books and travel guides, they'll tell us to go to, you know, these are the tourist sites and these are the monuments and these are the buildings to see. But aside from that, when you step into everyday culture, that's when you really realize, oh, wow, color is used in daily life in a way I you know completely unexpected yeah we have the example of also weddings in European culture we are always wearing the traditional white means uh, purity but before it wasn't even <laughs> white it was another color and then trends started and it became white when I got married in fact I have Berber heritage oh, so yay. from Tunisia yeah uh, so I was wearing traditional Berber outfit yeah it was nice because it's my heritage but I felt very far from this heritage along my life and then to connect back to it was really nice during my wedding mm -hmm. and they have also those really colorful outfits and yeah. I was like wow those, those are <laughs> like 
closer to my kind of people because they love color. And also when you are aware of colors has a different meaning in different cultures, you can also make home designs more inclusive. Lana work as interior designer, of course, you have to be very, very conscious of that. But actually there's some really interesting sort of symbolism and uh, sort of practices that are about color that are actually very historic. Yeah. And one of the things I touch you briefly on um, in my book is just this, some sort of origins of colour therapy, which goes back so far. We're talking like ancient Egyptian times. We're talking like before that, mm. where people understood the power of colour. They realised that colour does affect us. They took the sun and they understood that the, the sort of importance of light, so the importance of light in colour. And colour therapy has appeared in Ayurveda. It's appeared in Chinese medicine. So some of the most historic, oldest medicinal forms could see that actually colour can be used to heal. Mm -hmm. And how remarkable is that, that ancestors from years ago all <laughs> over the world knew the power of colour. And yet in modern times, it's, it's just been forgotten. Yeah, it's as if the European culture is like this adult that lost this connection to the Israel. <laughs> <laughs> And also the relationship with color around the world depends greatly on what we're finding in our surroundings, mm -hmm. pigments, also handcrafted techniques. So do you have any specific example mm -hmm. where that applies? Yeah, I mean, I think the pigment thing is really interesting. I actually came across a poster recently and it was like Pigments of London. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? And it was right. literally like, yeah, you can go down to, no, you think it's great. But if literally, if you go down to the temp and you can pick up different like rocks and stones and actually they'd, they'd uncovered these reds and some greens and some blues. And this is the thing, because like, where does colour come from? Mm. The fact is that colour natural pigments are the initial source of colour. And we can mix artificial colours and we can make colours, but there's so many colours in nature. And as we all move to a more sustainable way of living, we've really got to be more in, in tune with where we can get colour from. And I actually had the opportunity to do a natural dye workshop on one of my trips, which was in Mexico. And they said to us, we're going to be dyeing with pomegranates. They had all these pomegranates there, like that luscious red, pink skin, those beautiful red seeds of the fruits thinking, oh, it's going to be this gorgeous pink. And it blew my mind because although this fruit is red, pink, um, the dye was yellow. And I just couldn't believe it, like dyeing a pomegranate was yellow, but the most vibrant, vibrant yellow. And I actually bought a rug from one of the ladies at this women's cooperative, which is called Vida Nueva. And so they have a women's cooperative where they do the entire process of dyeing, spinning, weaving. Mm. And I bought a beautiful, beautiful rug from a lady that she'd spent six months making it. She wow dyed all the yarns herself and then did the weaving but this is the most vibrant rug it's literally got fluorescent pinks in there it's got bright greens bright yellows but every single one of those colors is a natural dye it's a natural color there's nothing artificial in it and it really proved to me we can not just get neutral colors i think there's a bit of an association that if you could use natural dyes it's going to end up being kind of earthy browns and mm. things but you can get the most vivid amazing colors that last forever by using natural colors mm -hmm. I mean indigo is a classic example and when I was in Thailand I remember I interviewed a lady who was an indigo dyer and she told me this brilliant story of when she was a kid she had this indigo school uniform But whenever it rained, ink is coming out. And that's when she understood, oh, there's actually an artificial indigo and there's a real indigo. And real indigo behaves in this particular way. And we don't need to create loads of fake colours. Mm. When we can at home, we can boil up onion skins, we can boil up beetroot, and we can actually make our own natural dyes and use those natural dyes in our homes, in our textiles, in our clothing. And we're causing much less damage because particularly the fashion industry, and I wouldn't be surprised if the interiors industry, so they don't talk about mm. the figures as much. Yeah. But in terms of like dyeing a pair of jeans and the way that all that blue ink is ending up in rivers and destroying yeah. things, um, is something that we just have to address.
Completely. I was thinking, for example, of in France, we have one particular style that is really out there in terms of interior design. It's the Provencal style, which is from the south of France. Mm -hmm. And it can be really colorful, but they're using natural elements from their surrounding. Like they get inspired by the beautiful lavender fields mm -hmm. that are really popping. Mm -hmm. And you have also the balance with the earthy tones, the terracotta, the lime, but it's vibrant. Absolutely. And that's what I really love about colour being everywhere. So the fact that colour is in nature, the fact that a lavender field is, is beautifully like lilac and then you've got like tulip fields and you've got like sunflower seeds and sunflower fields and we just get exposed to all these amazing colours and that's another way of appreciating colour because Colour isn't just something that you wear and it's mm. not just something that you decorate your home with. It is in every aspect of our life. This recording is airing just after the Holy Festival. So we can see that, in fact, colours are also very present in celebrations. 100%. You know, one of my favourite ways to enjoy colour is through celebration, is through festivities. I mean, I called my book um, Hello Rainbow, Finding Happiness in Colour, mm -hmm. because it's about colour mm -hmm. being this joyful, joyful thing. And festivals around the world use colour Holly is like the number one festival of colour. It's literally the festival of colour. It's a spring festival you know, associated with people throwing sort of colourful powders and each mm. colour has a different meaning. But then festivals historically, I mean, something like Mardi Gras um, in the States is it has a very distinct green, a distinct yellow, a distinct purple. Then there's like the Tomatina Festival in Spain where everyone's like jumping around in red tomatoes. And colour becomes the thing that symbolises all this like fabulousness mm -hmm. and all this bringing people together. It brings communities together. And then, you know, looking at things like Rio Carnival and even like David Dead, they've just become associated with actually what do these things look like? You know, the costumes, the outfits, you know, the decor the backdrops all of these things all these things are based on color christmas i think is such a funny time of year in the uk because uk homes that are so neutral like all year round neutral people as well but at christmas all of a sudden Tinsel, glitter, yeah. lights, decorations. <laughs> and you know what? These people are happier for it. They're better people for it. But they just do it for that, like, maybe mm. three weeks of the year. And then, then it goes back <laughs> to sort of, like, blandness again. But what if we were to actually take celebration, take festivities, and just have be reminded it every day? Have it every day. Yeah. I mean, you know, well, we'd just be feeling so much happier. I have to say, one of my neighbours does still have their Christmas lights up. And I, <laughs> but you can see through the window, they've still got their tree. I love that. I just think, in fact, when it was COVID year, I had my Christmas tree up for two years. I didn't take it down. Because <laughs> I was like, you know what, let's just keep the colour in the home. And I remember that year, people did put their Christmas trees up earlier. But even that example, people understood having colour in their home as a sort of shrine was this thing to bring them happiness. Mm. And we can just learn so much, I think, from festivals and, yeah, and celebrations. Completely. We tend to wait for a specific festival or mm. celebration to express ourselves and connect to colors, but you can do it every day. <laughs> I know also a festival in France, I don't know if you know it, it's the Dunkirk Carnival. Right, okay. It's really, really colorful. It's in uh, Dunkirk yeah. in the north of France. It's a city that is a bit like London, like really grey, yeah. like the sun is not always there, rainy a lot of, mm -hmm. of the time. And most of the day, like people are dressing like kind of really grey, beige colours and it's it's not like really vibrant. But during Dunkirk Carnival, <laughs> they all have very, very colourful umbrellas. Yeah. They're very bright colours. People are who they are. Yeah. Those festivities are helping people. Maybe during one day they can see this aspect of themselves mm. and say, I have this specific day during the whole year that I, I can find my own self. And maybe after some time they will want to have access to it like more mm. during the year and not just once. We're both part of the London Colour Walk community, mm. which is a regular meetup of colourfully dressed people. And one thing I find, this meetup happens monthly. Every single month, without fail, that I've ever been there, 
a passerby who just comes across this group of colourful people will always, always say, oh, I really love colour. I'm really colourful. I'm just not colourful today. <laughs> the pure joy of someone feels, as you say, like on that day, why can't they feel it all the time? Because of the cultural constraints that are in the way. But if we lifted that, people will live more fulfilling, more satisfying lives. So we've come to the end of our episode already. Mamtaz, do you have a final advice for our audience to maybe infuse more colors into their space, into their everyday life? I think the number one new thing you can do to just have more color in your life is actually just to spend a little bit of time, just put a bit of time aside and literally think about prioritizing color. Yeah. Like actually, if you think, you know what, I do want to have a piece of this pie, this joyful pie we've been talking about <laughs> in this episode. Like, how can I get a bit of the energy? It really is to make a bit of time for colour, to sit down with colours, find out what colours you like, make your own happy palette. Like, what are the colours? Pick three or four colours that you really love. Don't even compare it to existing palettes. Don't compare it to anyone else. Just be like, you know what? I love the way these colours look and start putting that into your everyday. It could be that you literally um, buy a pen in that color it could be that you buy a notebook in that color it could be that you buy a rug it doesn't matter just start incorporating um that color into your life and um i've got a few more tips like um in my book as well hello rainbow so obviously i'm going to recommend <laughs> picking up that i've got some rainbow rituals in there so it, it's got some theory in there but it's got practical activities as well so these are activities that you can do to incorporate more color into your life <laughs> so yeah take a look at that How could our listeners contact you? Probably the best place is Instagram. So it's momtazbh because my link tree at the top's got all my links to my podcast, my blog, my book and everything. But really, it's a positive, it's a place of positivity. It's a place where I like to share colourful, joyful pictures. Mm. So even that will give you a mood boost. Yeah, lots of inspiration. Your daily dose of <laughs> happiness and dopamine. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Thank Real you. Pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for just reminding people that make their homes colourful. <laughs> <laughs> We need more colours. So thank you for joining us on this colourful trip around the world. I hope you're going to continue following our journey into the world of colours. See you soon. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, Don't hesitate to subscribe, rate or review on the different listening platforms. To say hello and get all the latest from me, you can follow me on Instagram at rainbow.shaker. And if you want to check out my services, you can go to my website www.rainbowshaker.com. Thanks again and I wish you all a very colorful day. See you next time.